Good morning, everyone. We're ready to roll. So we continue our study of killing vectors and group of isometries and all this to be able to understand cosmology. So with a little luck, we should be able to get to cosmology next week. I would be happy if we get there a little earlier, but uh, we'll see how it goes. So uh, killing vectors are solution of this set of equations. So we just take the covariant derivative of a vector field, symmetrize, and this is supposed to be zero. We've seen that by differentiating this equation and manipulating it, we get this uh, uh, second order equation. Uh, and so this is a novel determined second order system of equations. Uh, it implies the following, that you take any point on your manifold, then the value of the killing vector at this point, and the value of the matrix of its covariant derivatives. Uh, this matrix has to be, of course, anti-symmetric because its symmetric part vanishes. So these two values determine a killing vector uniquely. And this has an important implication. Well, the space of killing vectors, the dimension of the space of killing vectors is the same as the dimension of the group of isometries. So the dimension of the group of isometries of a manifold is smaller than the uh, dimension of the maximal number of uh, maximal dimension of the space of killing vectors. And by just counting how many independent values of P and anti-symmetric matrices at P I have, we get this uh, upper bound here. So this is where we stopped last time. And uh, with a little of help from Eva, we'll be able to start a new paragraph. Um, it should be 6.1.6. 6.1.6, good. So that would be maximally symmetric manifolds. So we need a few definitions. So M is called, well, actually the pair because it's a pseudo Riemannian manifold. So I'm not making any uh, assumptions about the signature here. Uh, so uh, this, uh, so pseudo Riemannian manifold is called, um, well, first a homogeneous. If uh, the group of isometries of uh, MG, which we call ISO MG, so I'm not going to write it, but this is the group of isometries of this manifold, uh, acts transitively. Uh, so I will also say is transitive which it means that uh, for every pair of points, P, Q in M, there exists an isometry in, uh, sorry, an isometry, an element of this group, so that uh, phi of P is equal Q, All right? So transitive, take any two points, then you can find an isometry which maps one into another. Homogeneous, well, isotropic at a point. If for every vector tangent at P, uh, there exists an isometry. So an element of this group so that first phi doesn't move 
And if I push forward X, I get uh, isotropic. So, okay, every pair of vectors, I can map one into another, right? So, so here, the first picture is that I have two points P and Q, and I have an isometry which maps from P to Q. That's homogeneous. And here, I have now a point, two vectors, X and Y, and there exists an isometry of M so that, well, it doesn't move P. So, uh, well, yes, and uh, maps X into Y, right? So, so we have this. Uh, uh, push forward associated with this map. So because phi goes from this point to itself, the push forward will be a map from the tangent point of M to itself. And it should be, uh, well, of course, this is nonsense. Uh, <laughs> why is it a nonsense? Okay. This sentence is nonsense. There's no, no. I mean, I, I could define, I, I could make this definition, but of course, then there are the no manifold would be isotropic. So I let you think about it. Why is this nonsense? Okay, let, let's try. Uh, if I calculate G of phi star X, phi star X, by definition of an isometry, uh, this is the same, well, by definition of phi star uh, up, Right, this is a definition. So I'm not going to define what a push forward is because it's long. But once I know what the push forward is, I this is my definition of pullback. So this is definition of pullback. And now by definition of an isometry, this should be G of uh, XX. So definition of isometry. So, so isometries preserve lengths, right? That's what, that's what it says, right? So isometries preserve lengths. So if the vector y, if the vector x has lengths 25 and vector y has lengths 27, there's no way that this could be true, right? So it, it cannot be true that if you take any two vectors on a tangent space, you can find an isometry which maps one into another because isometries preserve lengths. So uh, if they don't have the same length, no way, right? So, uh, so here they should have same length, right? So in this definition, isotropic at P, that if you take two vectors of the same length, then there's one map which maps into one into another. So,
Good. So this is isotropic at P. Of course, you can just, uh, I'm not going to write this down, but isotropic at every point. Okay, well, isotropic means isotropic at every point. Right? Isotropic is, is uh, for every P. Uh, well, uh, the uh, isotropic at P. Uh, maximally symmetric is the obvious thing. Uh, namely, uh, yeah, the dimension of the isometry group is n, n plus one over two, which is the maximal possible dimension. Uh, example. Uh, just take R n with eta. Well, eta has any signature, any signature. Uh, uh, flat, right? Any signature flat. So constant entries. So this is one example, but many because n as many n's and as many eta's. So it could be Riemannian, it could be Lorentzian, it could be signature 2537. Uh, so we have the equation d mu uh, d, uh, d alpha d beta x gamma is equal to zero, right? because the curvature vanishes, Riemann equals zero. And in natural coordinates, this is the same as d alpha d beta x gamma equals zero. So, uh, so, uh, so x uh, is uh, a linear map, right? I alpha, uh, but if I write gamma here, I'd better write gamma there, but since we started with the equation, well, I need to fix this anyway. All right, so second derivative are zero means that this is a, a, an affine map, a linear map, Plus translations, and uh, and the condition that uh, d alpha x beta plus d beta x alpha equals zero gives me that this matrix is anti-symmetric. So I have all the killing vectors, right? So. I just give any anti-symmetric matrix. And uh, then this is my killing vector. And of course, A gamma beta is eta gamma alpha A alpha. So where you're raising the index with the matrix you have, right? So if this is a, Riemannian mit metri uh, metric in natural coordinates, the flat metric, then this would be the indices raised would be the same as the indices down. Maybe if it's a Laurentian, then the time co co component changes sign. And if it is a uh, signature 2537, then 25 components will change sign and 37 will not. So it's always true that this one is anti-symmetric, no matter what the signature is. But of course, this one uh, will have no obvious symmetries in general. So these are all killing vectors. And uh, the elements of, group, of the group are uh, obtained by taking flows of these vectors, right? So just need to take a flow of every of these vectors. You get a one parameter group of subgroup of the group of isometries.
So what is the flow of such a vector? Anyone remembers? So if taking the flow means that you have to take solve a equation. So let's do this. Uh, so we have to solve flows. Well, let's see. Uh, suppose, for example, A alpha beta equals zero. This one is easy. Then uh, I have to solve the equation dx gamma over d oh, kind of sleepy today as far as my efficiency goes, at least. So we have to solve the equation dx alpha over d t is x alpha. Uh, when a is zero, then this is just C alpha, which is constant. So uh, X alpha of T is the original value plus C alpha of T. So this is just translations. Maybe I shouldn't have called this parameter T because you think about time, you shouldn't. Uh, so if I just take, well, phi, tau the flow of this vector as a function of x is just x plus uh, c uh, c tau right so if we take c equals zero then i need to solve dx alpha over dt is a alpha beta x beta. Again, I should have written tau, but maybe you'll excuse me. How do I do this? Well, exponential of a matrix, right? So x alpha is x of a Uh, right, uh, so a times t acting on x, x naught. What is the exponential of a matrix? Well, that's the obvious definition, right? This is a sum n equals zero to infinity, a alpha beta times t. Well, the matrix. I, A times T power N over N factorial. Okay. So that's what it is. In other words, phi tau of a point X is this exponential of A tau acting as a point on X. All right, so this is exponential of a matrix, which is a matrix acting on the initial point. Uh, these are the solutions. Okay, so these are uh, all one parameter 
subgroups of the isometry group of uh, a flat Rn, no matter what the signature of this metric X. So that's a pretty simple example. Uh, good. What can we, can we say? So now uh, some facts about geodesics and isometries. I should emphasize, right, that so uh, all isometries of Rn with a flat metric will be uh, composition of these of these maps. So first, every isometry is belongs to one parameter group of isometries. That's something I haven't proved, but that's true. Right? So this means that every isometry must come from one of these things. Uh, of course, I, and then. Uh, it should be pretty clear how to compose them, right? So you just uh, make a rotation or a Lorentz boost or some higher signature, funny linear transformation like that and compose it with a translation and that's all your isometries. I'm almost tempted to wash this again. It's just so disgusting, but I hope you're going to forgive me one that this is not as perfect as I used to having a perfect light board. And uh, well, this is not up to my standards. Okay, good. So let's see what next. Uh, so some remarks, right? Some remarks about isometries. Uh, Uh, so first, obviously, uh, isometries preserve distances. Well, I'm not sure what this means, though, right? So one has to be a little careful. So this is clear in the Riemannian case, at least, right? So Riemannian case, uh, how do you define distance? Uh, distance between the two points. is the inf over curves from p to q integral of the length of the curve right so g of gamma dot gamma dot so if you take any curve between p and q apply an isometry uh, then uh, the, this integral will not change, right? So invariant under isometries. Because, uh, well, just because, period, right? So it's obvious. So, and therefore the infimum will be invariant under isometries. So the distance will, will not change. Of course, one has to be a, uh, uh, this makes sense for a Riemannian metric. Uh, for a Lorentzian metric, you can uh, do something uh, uh, actually the other way around. Uh, if P, Q are uh, causally related,
then you can just define something. Let me just call the sigma of PQ. And now not the inf, but the sub of uh, gamma from PQ and say gamma is uh, uh, causal, right? Gamma causal and integral of G of gamma dot gamma dot. So rather than taking the inf, you take the soup. Uh, well, taking the inf here is related to the Cauchy Schwarz inequality, for example. And that's, uh, uh, and uh, because in the Lorentzian geometry, you don't have Cauchy Schwarz, you have inverse Cauchy Schwarz, then. So that's one way of understanding why you should take soup rather than inf. But another one is to uh, think about the following. If you have two points, just say in a flat space time, and there is a straight line between them, then this is, will be actually, uh, in Minkowski space time, this would be this Lorentzian distance between these points would be just the time between them. But uh, you can make, uh, uh, you can find a curve which has zero lengths by going along a light cone. Right? If you went from here to Q or along this curve, then this is a null curve, has zero lengths. This one is no, has zero lengths. So, uh, Taking the infimum would actually give you always zero. That's an example in Minkowski, uh, but more generally, you can just do this in, in any manifold. Taking infimum, taking over causal curves would also give you zero. Zero is a very nice and interesting function, but doesn't carry much information. Right? It's smooth and everything, but not very useful to tell you something interesting. But taking the supremum in the Lorentzian case is the thing we want to do. Of course, taking the supremum in, uh, uh, in, in Riemannian geometry wouldn't make sense, right? Because you can just go to, from one point to another by an arbitrary long curve, just circling around a million times before you get to the other one. And uh, so that would not be very interesting. Good, but so isometries preserve distances in the Riemannian case, that's clear and obvious. And, from us, actually, that's the most important thing that we're going to be using. But there is some kind of generalized notion of distance that one can use here uh, in the Lorentzian case, which is nowhere as useful as the distance in Riemannian geometry, but uh, it still has some interesting information. So yes, but so this is distances, but what is useful regardless of signature is the fact that uh, isometries preserve geodesics. And a geodesic is a, a invariantly defined notion. You don't, so a, a geodesic is mapped to a geodesic by isometries. But not only uh, do uh, isometries map geodesics to geodesics, but they also uh, preserve their fine distance along the geodesic, right? So uh, isometries map uh, geodesics 
to the other x. Uh, they preserve the parametrization. So, uh, so uh, let's see. So, if you have a, a gamma is a geodesic. starting at P with initial velocity say uh, Z then if I take Phi of gamma is a geodesic starting at Phi of P with initial the velocity, the push forward of Z, right? So I have a point P and this is gamma with tangent Z. I apply a isometry. This is phi of P and I get phi of gamma is again a geodesic. Again, I finally parameterized and the tangent vector will be the push forward of Z. And because they preserve the parametrization, then we'll have that uh, phi of, so phi is an isometry. If I take gamma of S, Okay, let's do this like that. So let's call this phi z will be geodesic starting at p with initial velocity z. Then this is a, a phi of gamma z is a geodesic starting at phi of p with tangent z. So this is the same as you just take a geodesic with tangent phi star of z of s, okay? So this is gamma z of s. And this is phi of gamma z. Uh, so this is gamma a geodesic starting uh, with tangent phi star of z of s. Um, A final remark here is what happens uh, for isometries which have a fixed point.
Um, okay, so uh, suppose that uh, phi of p is p. So we have an isometry which maps a point to itself. So then the tangent map a phi star of uh, is uh, maps the tangent space to itself. And uh, of course, it preserves um, the metric, right? So, uh, but uh, the tangent space with uh, the metric, uh, what you have on this tangent space is just a, a vector space with a, uh, a, a flat metric, right? So it's just, uh, you just have a, a, a linear map, a, a, a quadratic form on this space. And so phi star uh, is an isometry, uh, um, right? An isometry of, well, a linear map. Well, it's a linear map. So an isometric linear map, right? An isometry linear map. Which preserves uh, the uh, G. So, uh, so, so if you just diagonalize G, so either it could be the Minkowski metric, which you're interested in, right, or uh, uh, positive case, and then here you just get Lorentz transformations. So let me call this case uh, A and this case B. And A, you just get Lorentz transformations of TPM. While uh, in the case B, you get orthogonal transformations orthogonal transformations of TPM. So everything you know about the Lorentz group, you can use on this map phi star. Uh, but then you can use whatever we know about geodesics to say what happens with the geodesics. And because so here, uh, if we have a Lorentz boost in the tangent space, then this isometry which goes with it will take a geodesic in your space time and map it to a geodesic which will be the Lorentz boosted of the original one in the sense that its tangent, initial tangent, will be the Lorentz boost of the initial tangent of the previous geodesic. Good. So these are the things which you, it's good to keep in mind when thinking about isometries and when trying to understand that. And let's try to formulate a important theorem, which is uh, important for cosmology. So we'll be looking at three dimensional manifolds. This will be the surfaces of constant time. So, Remember this funny cosmological principle, which is the hypothesis that the universe has a time function uh, with uh, level sets which are homogeneous and isotropic. Um, we'll shortly see a slightly different version of this statement, but that's the something which is often used in this context. So we want to understand then these uh, level sets of this uh, time function, which will be Riemannian manifolds, uh, which are homogeneous and isotropic. So, Yeah, my, my marker is uh, one kilometer away. <laughs> so, uh, 
I let me try another one. Let's see how this one will work. Somehow my erasing here is much better than my erasing on this side. Very weird. Uh, so uh, fundamental theorem here. The following the following statements. So let MG be a three-dimensional uh, Riemannian manifold. Then the following are equivalent. Yeah, this one was, this marker was much better than, than this, but I think it's still legible. So, uh, so one, uh, uh, MG is, homogeneous and isotropic. Two, Mg is homogeneous and isotropic at some point. And three, Mg is maximally symmetric. Okay. So cosmological principle is the thinking that we have time functions and on the level sets are homogeneous and isotropic. So this is the case which would be kind of philosophically appropriate for cosmology. This one is saying, well, actually you don't have to be isotropic everywhere. It's uh, enough to be isotropic at one point. If you're homogeneous, you'll be isotropic at every point. So uh, you could think that this one is uh, a little more natural because it's going to tell you, well, we live in this universe and we see that the universe is the same in all directions. So some point is us here, right? And we're saying, We'll, we see the universe in the same in all directions. Then if we assume homogeneity that we're not any one better in this universe. So if I go to another point, there's an isometry which takes me to another point, then it will be isotropic at the other point as well. So that's, uh, that's that. And in fact, uh, you have to be maximally symmetric. So this is the third sentence. Whenever you are one or two, you're maximally symmetric. Um, let's see how, how this works. Um, well, so the proofs, uh, there are some parts which are rather easy. So one implies two is obvious. Uh, two implies three. So 
So uh, this is a, a dimension counting. So here the idea is how many parameters do I need in my group to be homogeneous and isotropic? Well, to be homogeneous is uh, obvious. I have a three-dimensional manifold and I have to be able to go from every point, from one point to every other one. So I need at least three parameters for this in my group, right? Because I need to be able to find different isometries which give me map from this point to this one and this one to this one and this to this one and so forth. So homogeneity requires at least three parameters. Uh, then uh, how many parameters I need to be isotropic at one point? Of course, if I'm isotropic, the isometries which uh, do not leave this point but only change its directions, uh, they're not going to, they're, they're going to be different from the ones which map this point to this one. So these are completely different parameters, right? So I need at least three parameters to be homogeneous and at least a number of parameters to be isotropic. So how much parameters do I need, right? I have a sphere of directions uh, at, around me and I need to be able to map every unit vector on this sphere to every other one, right? So the sphere is two dimensional. So I certainly need at least two parameters to map every vector on a sphere to another one. So at least two parameters on the sphere, at least three parameters for the homogeneity. So I need at least five parameters. Well, it turns out that we need a little more. And this has to do with the, uh, how many parameters you have in the rotation group. So, Uh, so here, uh, now, first, uh, need at least three parameters. For homogeneity. And the claim is that you need another three parameters and not two for isotropy at P. So how does this work? Because uh, first, so the group, uh, so we have a uh, uh, the group uh, of isometries uh, which form, which fix uh, P 
is a subgroup of uh, the rotation group. And this is what I just, we just discussed before. If you're just uh, take an isometry which fixes this point, then we, the maps, the tangent maps, which are associated to it are just rotations of Euclidean space. So uh, the set of isometries which fix this is of course a subgroup of the group of isometries. And therefore it's a subgroup of the rotation group. Now, and uh, it, has, uh, it has at least two parameters. to act transitively, to map every unit vector to every other one, every unit vector on a sphere to another one. But, so, so the question is what are subgroups of, uh, of the rotation group. In three dimension. Uh, have dimension. Uh, zero, one, or three. How does one see that? So has someone a suggestion? How can one see that? That uh, subgroups of the rotation group. So we don't need anything fancy, no complicated geometry, just elementary considerations about the rotation group. There should be a simple way of seeing that. Uh, I haven't uh, I haven't thought about one. So let's see. So the zero dimensional, right? So zero D uh, dimensional is just uh, the identity, right? So that's the zero dimensional subgroup. So one dimensional would be rotations around an axis. So you choose an axis, make a rotation, you get your one dimensional subgroup and two dimensional, there are none. So that's the point, right? I mean, three dimensional is the whole group, of course, right? Three dimensional, the whole group. So, so that's the, questionable guy. Good, so this is true. And try to figure it out, right? So exercise. If somebody has an idea how to prove it in a simple way, I, I don't know a simple proof. 
I'm not sure whether this is a full proof, but there's an idea, one may say that since every rotation has to be around an axis, having two um, linearly independent elements in a subgroup means that the axis of one rotation can get rotated by the other rotation, which means you can then get a basis of the entire space throughout which you can rotate by rotating the one axis to another position, if that makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, okay. That's an interesting suggestion. Uh, maybe one could really build a complete proof around what you're saying. My thinking here would be the following: that if you take uh, two uh, generators of rotations, uh, so sigma one and sigma two, right? So you're saying, well, you have suppose you have two two rotations, then they're obtained by uh, rotating around axis so there's a killing vector which goes with this so we can just take uh, these two generators then uh, if you take the commutator sigma 2 is either zero or uh, a third third uh, third killing vector right third generator of rotations And so that's the, if you just think of the algebra, sigma i, sigma j of the generators of, of, of spin matrices, then this is epsilon i, j, k, sigma k. As soon as they don't commute, they produce a third one. That, that's, the, that's the argument here. And I'm trying to write a formal proof along these lines. I just don't dare trying to do this, but uh, that's the... Uh, rough ideas right so if you take uh, um, the problem you reduce it to a problem of killing vectors because you know that every group of isometries is a league, league group so there will be two killing vectors which go with it these are these generators of rotations and as soon as you have two different ones then the commutator is a third and uh, so there's no no two-dimensional this statement is the same as saying uh, much easier, right? So this is the same as saying that uh, uh, there are no two-dimensional uh, subalgebra subalgebras of the Lie algebra, which is SO three of the. Uh, Of SO3, right? So SO3 is the Lie algebra of the rotation group. You can just uniquely describe it by three matrices which satisfy this commutation relation. And this algebra has no two dimensional subalgebras. That's what uh, this is the algebraic version of this more difficult statement about subgroups of a group uh, reduced to this one. And good. Good. So where are we? OK, so we need at least three parameters for homogeneity. And we need another three for isotropy, because we need at least two for isotropy, but there are no two-dimensional subgroups of the rotation group. So you need three. So you need six parameters, right? So uh, homogeneity and isotropy at some point already implies six parameters. So the dimension has to be at least six. And in dimension three, but this is precisely the maximal dimension. So one needs at least six parameters, uh, which is precisely equal three, uh, three plus one over two. So, so you can't have more, right? This is maximal symmetry and you need exactly 
this number, otherwise it will not have enough. Good. So, uh -huh. so this is our theorem. So let's see, the theorem had three points. Uh, so we've proved uh, one implies two, two implies three, uh, three implies one. Uh, we're going to actually follows from um, our construction of uh, that we're going to do from a construction that we're going to do. So the circle is closed, but uh, there's a Q's uh, uh, observation note, uh, how do you prove two implies one? In other words, so this was a homogeneous uh, and isotropic at one point. And this is homogeneous and isotropic at every point. So I like this proof, so I, I, I need to show it to you. <laughs> and so the way it goes as follows. So, so we want to show, uh, so we assume two, uh, want to show oh, okay, well that, that's that's not the proof I like, but okay. Want to show uh, that uh, if um, x, y are tangent at q, then there exists an isometry so that, and q is uh, not different, uh, not equal p, right? not equal p so um, uh, because if it's p it's obvious right so but so that that that, that there is uh, with the same lengths right so uh, same lengths um, same length Uh, so that phi, the uh, wrong star should be star up, the push forward of X is Y. Right. Yeah, so this one is not the cute one, but uh, okay, well, we probably won't have time to do the cute ones. Let's see, what was the cute one? Um, isotropic at every point, right? Oh. So maybe we'll need this one too. Let's worry about it later. Let's see. So, uh, so we have a point P here, a point Q here two vectors x and uh, y. And we know that uh, the manifold is homogeneous. So there exists the phi one, uh, which maps q to p. OK. 
Okay, so we have an isometry by one here. Then we have uh, uh, the push forward of X, which is a vector here. And we have the push forward of Y. which is a vector here. Now isotropy uh, at P, then there exists phi two, which maps uh, I want to, yeah. So for example, phi one star X to phi one star y. Okay, so phi one star y is phi two star phi one star x. But then y is phi one star minus one phi two star phi one star x and uh, which is the same as uh, phi 1 composed minus 1 composed with phi 2 composed with phi 1 star x right. so that's my isotropy that's my That's my isometry, right? So composition of isometries is an isometry. So once again, two points P and Q, I can map by homogeneity. There's an isometry which maps Q to P. So the vector X will go to push forward with phi one of X. Y will go to push forward of Y with phi one. Now, all directions are equivalent here. So there is an isometry which maps this direction to this one. This is two, phi two. So it's mapping phi one star X to phi one star Y. So that's the equation. Uh, phi two star produces phi one star Y. So I just apply the inverse map here and I get that Y is the image uh, of X under uh, this map. So you just need to make sure that the, the star uh, of the, the inverse of the star is the same as the, so what I'm using here is that the phi star minus one is the same as phi minus one star. It's one thing that I've used, and I've also used the fact that if I compose two maps, then the tangent maps are, are just working like that. So this is just saying that the Jacobi matrix, I mean, what is phi star? Phi star is the Jacobi matrix of, of this application, right? So the ma Jacobi matrix of a Composition is the product of Jacobi matrices. Uh, and uh, the Jacobi matrix of the inverse is the inverse of the Jacobi matrix of the application. Good. So in my equivalences, I should have probably added one more point, And that was the cute proof that I was talking about, because it, has, uh, it plays some conceptual role in what we're going to do. Namely, if you are isotropic at every point, you are also homogeneous. So that uh, independent of this maximal symmetry, uh, because this is true in all dimensions. Now this, argue, this, this uh, theorem I told you about maximal symmetry, I think is wrong in higher dimensions. I'm not sure if somebody knows 
I'd be interested to, please send me an email. I believe that it's not true that homogeneous and isotropic at every point implies maximal symmetry in high dimensions. I think it's probably wrong, but I'm not sure. So, um, anyway, yes? I have a question. Uh -huh. um, why is it phi two star here? Which one? Um, yeah, right there, right there already, because we first we just said that there's a phi two that maps those right. to each other. Phi two maps the manifold to itself, but vectors are mapped with the tangent map. Right. So, so phi two is a isometry of this manifold into itself, which doesn't move p, and it acts on vectors by the tangent map right so that's mm. so there exists okay. an isometry of the manifold and this money that then on on tangent vectors it maps with the tangent map okay thank okay you, thank, thank you for asking i should have said that Right, so, so let me write what I said, right? So you have a phi, it goes phi of P uh, is P, then the tangent map maps the tangent map from P, well, uh, to the tangent map of me. In, in, in general, if phi of P is equal Q, then vectors phi star will map T P M to T Q. M, right? But to map vectors to vectors, you need the tangent map. Right? So phi goes from M to M, and phi star goes from tangent spaces to tangent spaces. So here we had vectors at this tangent space, so we needed the tangent map to, to map them into each other. Yes, so the last fact here about these isometries, if, and this is in all dimensions, uh, if mg is isotropic at every point, and Riemannian, right, so mg Riemannian, at every point, then, uh, Mg is homogeneous. So this is one, uh, another variation uh, on this notion of uh, symmetry. So uh, suppose we believe that there is a good uh, time function in the universe. Uh, and we know from experience that whatever we see uh, around us is the same in all directions. And we say, well, but then we are not preferred. So everybody else on this level set of this our time function will have this property that will see the same universe in all directions right so this is isotropic at every point well if it is so then in fact it's already homogeneous right so this homogeneity is actually follows from isotropy at every point good and the proof is cute and that's the cute proof i was anticipating before so just take uh, uh, PQ to points, and you take uh, geodesic between them. So this is a well. You you take a distance minimizing would be best. Okay. So but uh, so distance minimizing geodesic. Well, I, let's not go into too much details whether there exists things like that or not. Let's just 
assume that this works. Distance minimizing geodesic, minimizing geodesic. So the distance between P and Q is say R, right? So go a distance R here. And what you do, you go to the midpoint. So let Q, uh, P, Q, R, well, uh, Q be the midpoint. Uh, so now you can go from big Q to Q by following this distance minimizing geodesic in this direction, a distance or half. Now we have assumed that This manifold is isotropic at every point. So it's isotropic at big Q as well. So there is an isometry which maps this vector to its opposite. So if this is vector gamma dot here, then this is exists a psi isometry so that minus gamma dot is the image of gamma dot, right? So you can find an isometry which maps gamma dot to this one. Now, if you go in this direction for a distance r half, you're going to end at q, right? So if you take this geodesic here, you can map it using this isometry, this half geodesic, which goes from Q to P, you map it to this half geodesic, which goes from capital Q to P. But the distance is preserved. So, so this, uh, the claim is that uh, this isometry psi maps psi of Q is P. And this is nothing but our formula which says that geodesics are preserved by isometries and the geodesics with a different uh, a tangent in this direction is mapped to a geodesic with a tangent of, of that direction. And if you are a distance away, R half, on this geodesic, then you're going to be a distance away r half of this geodesic, right? So p is a distance r half from q on this geodesic. Q is a distance r half from gamma from capital Q on this geodesic, and because geodesics are mapped to geodesics, then uh, Q is mapped to p. So this is uh, the proof. So we know that so Q is the image, so it lies on uh, a geodesic uh, with starting at Q with gamma dot, 
well, maybe let me not, not use, well, it's the same symbol, right? So, uh, well, let, let me call this vector so that we don't get confused. Uh, so let uh, X be gamma dot at uh, R half, right? R, R half, which is a vector on the tangent space of Q of M. So if I take Q, it's on a geodesic, and let me use a different symbol here. So this is going to be gamma x at r half. So we note gamma x is the geodesic starting at q with tangent x. So q, we start at Q with tangent gamma dot, and we end at Q, right? And this is uh, then, uh, if I take psi of gamma X of our half, so we take the image of this geodesic going this direction, this is the same as the geodesic going starting at Q with the directions psi star of X at R half. So, but this is minus gamma dot. So going on this geodesic from P to Q is the same as going on, well, if I restart with this direction by uniqueness of geodesics, I'm going to follow exactly the same curve. So this is uh, P. So. Good. I just wrote in detail what, what I said in words here. Good, so now we have five minutes to start something new, doesn't make sense. So let me just tell you what we're going to do next time. So this is just a spoiler for next time. Uh, we're going to try to construct all maximally symmetric Riemannian manifolds. Uh, personal message to Elizabeth Naver. Uh, Elizabeth, you asked me about uh, when the exams take place. Uh, yes. Well, you should, well, I, I think to, to have a, 
uh, authoritative, so legally binding answer. You should look it up <laughs> on the web page of the SSC. But uh, uh, not, uh, but uh, well, to the best of my knowledge, it's around July 1. So uh, it's either June 30 or July 1, and which of them I don't remember. So, uh, so if you want to have a, uh, an exam, it would be either June 30 or July 1, or there'll be several uh, further possibilities uh, in October and so forth. So uh, if you're interested in June 30 or July 1, just let me know and we can, um, we can uh, find a, a, a slot which is convenient. The, the exams are uh, mainly online. So let's see. So, uh, so next time, right? So next time is uh, uh, construct or actually simply connected. So uh, let me just add this for. Uh, to be complete uh, or uh, maximally symmetric Riemannian manifolds. And uh, the idea is, I'm going to give you the idea now, and so maybe if you want to brood over it, the following. You take uh, a surface, uh, uh, so you take Rn with a quadratic form, which will have uh, the sign some signature. Uh, then we consider, um, now the point here, we already know what is the group of isometries here. So we have the, the dimension of the group is, uh, 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 uh -huh. So dimension is uh, n plus one. How is it? N n plus one over two, right? N n plus one over two, right? But if you uh, without uh, translations, so if you just forget translations, you're going to get n n minus one over two. Um, so if eta is the, uh, has the Lorentzian signature, that would be the Lorentz group. The Lorentz group is six dimensional. And in four dimensions, so you have four dimensions, Lorentz group six dimensional. That's exactly the dimension you need for a three dimensional maximal, uh, maximally symmetric Riemannian manifold, right? So that's, uh, so we consider, uh, uh, a sub 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 uh, sub manifold, right? So I have a, I have a surface. Say sigma r is going to be the set of points satisfying eta alpha beta x alpha x beta is a. So this has dimension. n minus one. Now sigma i is preserved by the Lorentz group. Uh, so by isometries of Rn, which preserve the origin. So let's call this, uh, let's see, uh, uh, say SO of eta. Okay, so let me just call this like that. And the metric is preserved, right? Eta alpha beta is preserved by this, by this group. So this means that the induced metric is preserved. I'm going to repeat this next time, but just to give you an idea what we've done, right? So induced metric on sigma R is preserved. And so this is going to give us our model space. So 
uh, sigma i with the eta restricted to sigma a uh, is uh, as n n minus one half dimensional group of isometries and this is exactly the maximal dimension for an n minus one dimensional manifold right which is maximal dimension for n minus one dim manifold so n is the dimension of our n we have a hypersurface in this Rn, which has one dimension less. It has the isometries, which are all Lorentz transformations or all Lorentz transformation or all rotations of, of this Rn. Uh, and uh, this is exactly the dimension you need if you are on a hypersurface one dimension less. So these are going to give us the famous. Friedman, Lemaitre, Roberts, and Walker metrics that one uses in cosmology. So, with a little luck, we'll get to cosmology at the end of the lecture on Thursday. Any questions? Sorry, I have a question about the exam. Uh -huh. So, did I understand it correctly? So, if we want to participate, we have to write you an email. And yes, do we because also because the so so the official dates are around end of the month, and uh, because it's oral, we have to do it uh, one on one. So uh, we need to find a okay. time slot. And do we also have to register over you find? Or and you have to register in any case uh, okay. on the university because otherwise the exam doesn't count. So okay, so and. In so, the system, you have to be uh, registered. Uh, in this oral version of the exam, uh, like exactly. how long so, time, what's the time, like how long does so it take? It's about uh, an hour. You, you should think about an hour, right? So, okay. And you know the questions. Uh, I'm not going to ask you all of them. I'm going to choose three of them, but. Uh, yeah, uh, and on the written exam, if you would have to like write uh, about these topics, like write yes. an extended. Right. Uh, so, so you we're to going do the same to now or? You, we're going to either well you a lot of students just write on a sheet of paper with the webcam directed to it and i can kind of read it if you have a tablet or a okay I see. whiteboard or something like that that's even better but you can just write on a piece of paper and yeah, tell me everything you know about the topics which are listed on okay the, thanks the questions Good. Well, so thanks a lot and uh, see you uh, Thursday. Bye-bye. Bye. See you then. Bye. Yeah, bye.